I, in this particular platform, I need to say actually thanks to you. I learned many things. And uh, as I have the relation with you, I learned many, many things and your consistent uh, encouragement towards me. Otherwise, I might be not uh, achieved this particular position. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, ma'am. Thanks. Uh, thanks I'm once humble, again. but you deserve much more than this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. On, th thanks once again. Uh, oh, welcome to all the participants to this particular workshop. Uh, today, we're going to discuss some of the contents on transfer learning and uh, at, at, in which situations we need to select the transfer learning from, uh, algorithms and what are the different type of alga, uh, architectures to design and uh, what are the impacts of those al uh, architectures in few applications we'll going to discuss. <clears throat> so transfer learning. So the name itself is saying that we would like to transferring knowledge, of, knowledge which you have gained in X and you're transferring that knowledge to the another application called Y. So transferring the knowledge of one model to perform a new task. So this is something also called as a domain adoption. So now why we need to do such type of concepts of transfer learning, especially in the deep learning algorithms. In which situation it is going to help us. Generally, you might be here about the one of the biggest data set, database that is called ImageNet data set. So ImageNet data set, we have a, it is having a huge number of samples. If you want to train any of the model, you, you need huge amount of GPUs are required. So minimum you need 256 GPUs are required to complete the process within one hour. But we doesn't have that much of infrastructure to solve or run our models on a bigger data sets like ImageNet. So if we will adopt the concepts of transfer learning, then it will be cheaper and faster to use this concept in another applications. So this is uh, some properties of ImageNet data set. If you can able to uh, see the comments of uh, Sammy Bangio from Google Research Scientist, he stated that the ImageNet data set it is a size is by far much greater than anything else available in the computer vision community and thus helped some researchers develop algorithms they could never have produced otherwise. Because this ImageNet data set is one of the very biggest data set and which is uh, developed by Fifi Lee. She is a professor in uh, Stanford University. Their research group has developed this particular data set that's called ImageNet data set. And this particular data set was initially presented in 2009 CVPR conference in Florida. And this data set is having 14 million images out of which, which is having 20,000 categories. So 20,000 categories is not a simple thing. And each category is having almost 1,000 images. So as it is ha having this diversified patterns are available, or diversified classes are available in this particular image data set, Imagine, imagine a data set. So training in any of the algorithm, deep learning algorithm is one of the biggest cha <clears throat> challenging in nature. This is very, very challenging to develop and design a particular model so that it can able to understand these diversified features. <clears throat> so in order to run your model on this much of the big data set is one of the challenging scenario. So if you can able to see some of the architectures which are available in the literature. So this is a VGSnet 2014 data set. The VGS represents visual geometry group. Here they have initially in VGSnet 2014 data set, which is an enhanced version of AlexNet and JDFNet. Here, if you can able to see the architecture, this is a sequential architecture with a uniform three cross filter size they have used across this particular architecture. But in the previous cases like AlexNet and all, they have used 11 cross 11 filters and 7 cross 7 filters and so on. So 11 cross 11 filters they are used in the AlexNet and 7 cross 7 size of filters they have used in the JDFNet. So here a deep architecture, but it is a sequential one where you have used the uniform filters of 3 cross 3. Similarly, in 2014, 
the Google Net has uh, introduced a new uh, module that is called inception module. So inception module, the importance of this inception module here is you can extract multi-scale features. So what is here my multi-scale features? So in the previous uh, VGZ, if you can able to see the VGZ, VGZ 16 architectures, here the uniform filter of three cross three is used across. Or in other field, other architectures, they have used either seven cross seven or five cross five or eleven cross eleven and so on. That are also in a sequential manner. But if you can able to see in this particular Google Net architecture, they have used multi-scale filters where one cross one will go into do some type of a point processing operation, and three cross three will go into do like a neighborhood operations at a region of at a radius of one, and five cross three is going to do the neighborhood operation or mask operations with a radius of two. So if you can able to see here, three cross three is going to extract some features from a given input data. Five cross three is also going to extract some receptive information from the given input data. One cross one also going to give some information, but at the end, you are going to combining all these particular multi-scale features together here to try and your models. What are the advantage of doing is how it can able to affect the performance of your model. We're going to discuss late uh, in, in some time with some pictorial representations. So in 2014, we, uh, there is a, another architecture was there that is called uh, ResNet 2014 architecture. So actually, the ResNet has won uh, first prize in uh, ILSV RC 2015 classification competition. And if you can able to observe in, in the object detection concepts, in place of using this VGC 16, they replace the VGC 16 with uh, ResNet 101 as a backbone model in the faster RCNM. So in the object detection, we have a backbone model was there. In backbone model to extract the features, initially they have tested with the VGC 16 architecture. In place of VGC 16, now they replace with the ResNet 101. And by using these residual connections, they got the better performance. So what is, what is meant by the residuality? If you can observe this particular diagram here, residuality, you have some given input data X. You are trying to pass this information to the second layer that is called X T plus one. Also, you are going to extract some extra features and you're going to merge it after some time. So the previous information you're trying to add after some extent of time, therefore, the feature should not be degraded or nullified. What is the meaning of feature degradation and all? That also we're going to discuss. Now you try to observe this particular uh, architectures here, which is 19 in a sequential manner. And there are another model with the 34 layer is also in sequential model. And this is called ResNet model, ResNet 34, where you can able to see the residual connections. You try to observe here the residual connections here, residual connections here, that from a given input data, accepted some convolution operation that is with the help of seven cross seven convolution operation. What are the features you got it? The seven cross seven receptive responses are again added at the third convolution response. Again, the third convolution response output is again added at the fifth and so on. That means as the depth of the, as the model goes deeper, the previous informations are going to be added. Therefore, the features, whatever the model is trying to learn, it will not going to be vanish. Why it will going to vanish? We're going to see. Now, later on in 2018, if you can able to see, these are all the very deeper networks and where the num number of parameters are very high. To use this particular robustness of this deep learning concepts for compact device use like mobile in, in your uh, mobile, if you want to develop an algorithm, the existing architectures may not going to help you because it is, it is going to take a lot of time. So researchers have developed a compact and shallow network that is called mobile net. So the, the mobile net aim is to develop a very small network with minimum number of parameters to get some better performance. With that intuition, the mobile net has introduced in 2018. 
Now let's analyze what actually will going to happen if you apply a, a sequential network or what is the advantage of using the residual connections and so on. Let's assume this is my given input data. We are trying to extract some uh, three cross convolution operation by using some X filter for, uh, for uh, easy understanding. You got some features. As it is a deep network, let's assume I would like to do the second convolution operation on the first response. I got this response. As it is a deeper one, I want to repeat the same operation third time. So I got this response. So if you can observe this, what, what is your observation after three times repetition of the uh, convolution operations? Initially, at the first convolution operation, the edges are going to be detected. But in the second convolution operation, the edges are go was go uh, smoothing. But in the third convolution, the information is going to be ignored or information is going to be lost. So if you keep on repeating the operation in these type of applications, for example, you might be expecting the informations are going to be preserved as going deeper, but instead you are going to lose the information here. So then, then how come this particular residual connections may going to help us? So in the previous case, like a sequential, let's assume the given input data, the same filter of three class you have applied, you got some output, you have done some second convolution operation on the same thing, this is a response. Now, third time, this is a response, right? Now, what we're going to do is, whatever the first response is there, as a, what are the first receptive responses we got it here? Those things are going to be added after the third convolution operation. Now, after third convolution operation with the help of this residual connection that is called skip connection, after adding this, we can able to get the information here. You can able to see it here. Here, the information is still preserved. If you can observe the responses at the third convolution operation and after residual connection, what are the output you got it? So if you want to develop a deep CNN model, but you are intended to not to lose your information, then the skip connections or residuality will going to help us. Therefore, these informations can be further fed to the next level. So the model may able to learn. Let's assume if you're going to do one more operation on this image only without residuality, you may going to end up with a, some uniform response. Instead of getting some edges, the, all the edges are going to be filtered out and the uniform response may going to get it. Okay. In order to further analyze this concept, why it is so happening? Let's take a very, very general uh, observation. We have our uh, uh, album photo, color photo. Let's assume that color photo might be having some chalk powder or some powder, some noise was there. The first thing what you're going to do, you want, you want to remove the dust particle. So you're going to rub it. So removing the dust particle is something like a filtering operation. So first you have applied the first one. You, you Once you have a uh, user kachi for in any napkin to remove the dust, then assume you the dust has removed. You like that operation, you are keep on repeating this operation again and again and again in the same location. Instead of removing the noise information or dust particles, you can also going to remove the actual information. So that is what going to happening in the sequences structures. Now, there was an, another alternative thing we can we also need to do is, do we need to go only for the sequential structures? Can't we go in a parallel structures? Then how come it can help us? Now, if you can able to see in a uh, sequential structures, instead of sequential, we can go for the parallel structures here. So from a given input data, we have applied three different convolution filter operations. So we got some two different responses. Once I go into combine this, I can able to get the better information also. So you want to do two convolution operations. Instead of going in a sequential one after other, we can use this particular parallel structures also so that we can able to get the information we can preserve the we can we can preserve the information also the computational time also going to be reduced 
Now, further question also comes here is in this examples we have discussed on a three cursor convolution uniform filter size. What if we use multi scale filters like what are the inception model we have seen earlier? There they are using this uh, three different type of filters and they're going to use it. Now we can also going to use this uh, multi scale filters here. Now try to observe here. This is the three class C convolution operations uniform filter. This is the response on a same given input data. One filter of three class C we have used and similarly the another filter of five class Y we have extracted. If you can able to see the responses with the help of three class C and five class Y, the edge informations are different. Because here at a neighborhood of in three class C, with a reference point at a radius of one, it is going to consider the neighboring values. But at a, but in the five class five convolution operation, at a particular reference point, we are going to take the neighboring at a at a radius of two. So from a reference point, you are, you are going to take the neighbors at a longer distance. So in the five class way, you may can able to get the ma ma major changes, but in the three class, C, you can also going to get the minor changes also. So when I'm going to integrating these two, we can able to get the resultant response like this. So here, one thing we need to, uh, 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 we need to uh, take care while developing an algorithm that so as you know this convolution operation whenever you are applying a convolution operation without uh, padding operations then the boundary information may go into effect right the resultant response size may go into effect with, with respect to the given input data but here we need to be very careful that the resultant response of 3 cross 3 also the resultant feature map size of 5 cross 5 the size should be remain same then only we can able to do this particular operations like addition and so on the similarly the case which we have discussed in the residual connection also here we need to be very careful while uh, while doing these residual connections so before pooling operations we need to go for this residual connection so that the dimensionality issues may not going to happen that one observation we need to be uh, just we need to keep in our mind while developing any of the algorithm now how come this transfer learning these are all the few existing architectures and the limitations now how come this particular transfer learning will going to help us? The here the intuitions are so simple of using the transfer learning. So we knew this VG16 and all these popular networks, Google Net or Residual Net or any network, which they have trained on a diversified data sets and very big data sets. Will you decide the number of layers to be skipped? Will that be also be hyperparameter? How will you decide the number of layers to be skipped? Yeah, how to decide the number of layers to be skipped? That we that we will going to discuss. Yes, we will going to discuss on that. Now here, if you can able to see in the transfer learning, the, uh, the the basic traditional approaches for a given application, you have a three classes. If you want, you can able to run the different different networks on three different models. But in the transfer learning, one model you have already seen different different categories. You can adopt that and you can test in the new application also. That also can be possible because your, your popular algorithm like VG16 or ResNet, they already know how this particular, for example, I'm talking about uh, those algorithms already know how the circle will looks like, how the triangle will looks like, so that you can also use these particular models and you can also test in a new application. This also can be possible. And a similar type of things have already done in the literature. We're going to discuss few of the articles, popular articles. So in the transfer learning, we have three different types. One is the inductive learning, transitive learning, and unsupervised learning. What if the unseen for the transfer learning? Unseen data for transfer learning. See, unseen data is nothing but you are going to test your models on completely not used during the training. It means that you have used some X data. Suppose you have trained your model on, uh, uh, let's assume we have uh, 10 breeds of dogs. You have tested your model on seven breeds and three breeds you have not even tested. Okay. 
but you are uh, not even used in the training that is called unseen data seen data is nothing but the similar content which is available during the training also in the testing so whenever you are going to use the same data during the training and testing that is called seen data so whenever you are going to test our models on the seen data the performance will be always better as compared to the unseen data but to develop any of the model for the real time purpose we need to develop our model which is going to perform best in the unseen environment also so that is how we are actually trying to run our models now yeah how we can able to go for this particular transfer uh, okay okay fine now how to do this particular transfer learning okay let, let's take a simple example with pictorically we can do this particular transfer learning in three different ways let's think about it let's assume this is one network vgc16 for example so vgc16 is having uh, which is a trained on uh, imagenet data set which is having a uh, thousand classes but let's assume i want to use this particular model for expression recognition for example so in expression recognition i need to use only six classes or seven class problem or you want to use this particular uh, vg16 network for your cat and dog classification it can be possible only two classes now this particular image net is having all varieties of uh, objects whether it can be cat dog human faces and so on so this model is already tested on a diversified environment so the the weights of this particular network is pretty good now you want to adopt this so we have two options are there take this particular network weights as this take this network completely then you just only freeze those weights the all the weights you can take it and freeze those weights at the end fully connected layer what are the fully connected uh, output neurons are there the only you can do the back propagation so by freezing the weights of the already trained which is 16 model and only train your model at the fully connected layer that is also one possibility later on if you want to do the fine tuning then you can unfreeze the weights initially instead of using this random initialized initial initialized weights you instead of using randomization you can use this particular already pre trained weights as a uh, inputs to the model and you can train this thing to the your uh, you can fine tune these weights as per your application that is one case of transfer learning there is an another case of transfer learning is that i knew this this is 16 layers of convolution operations are used in the vgc 16 but i don't want to use the rest of the layers initially only two layers i want to use it so you can use the initial two layer two layers from the vgc 16 model or resnet model or whatever the model you want to use it you can take those only two layers and freeze those weights because these these weights have already trained enough to extract the required features from a given input data maybe the application might be different here so that's why initially you take only two filters or two weights which are already trained and you can then you can use the customized filters how many how many how whatever different network you want to use it you can do that and you can do the back propagation and you can uh, you can train these weights in the newly assigned uh, filters that is one case or another case you can simply unfreeze the weights and you can able to do the fine tuning also so transfer learning the main intention of using this transfer learning is here is to your training process can be bit faster so your model can easily converse so this is the, this is what we are talking about here in the feature extraction what are the pre trained weights are there let's say assume i want to extract the features for the happy face here for the happy face i am going to use the vgc16 here for example i will i will going to get the features that's called before fully connected what are the features are there those features i am going to use it as as it is from the vg16 but at the end i need to change the classifier because the image net is having 1000 classes but my application is might be having six classes or seven classes so 1000 classes i cannot able to use it so i need to train only for the classifier that is one case or in other case i can do the completely uh, 
fine tuning by back propagating to the given in first layer also that is called by unfreezing the model you can able to do the back propagation that is called fine tuning another one is only simply transfer learning now the question comes here is so somebody told me that how to decide the network layers so the deciding of the network layers are purely depending upon an application for example just i have given you an example in a sequential layer network for facial recognition or facial expression recognition if you're going to do the deep cnn model you might be expecting the better results but you may not going to end up with the better results you are you may going to end up with the worse results reason here is if you go deeper and deeper the features are going to be ignored as i have shown in the previous uh, diagram like three times you have repeatedly do the convolution operation instead of extracting the edge information you may going to lose it but so in such application like facial expression recognition if you see the papers most of the papers they will try to use the shallow networks but if you can go for the applications where you have a many changes are available or uh, uh, diversified features are available in a particular given input data then maybe you can go for the deeper networks so selecting a network depth is purely depending upon the application where we want to apply similarly for this particular transfer learning also let's assume suppose we have a model a train on a data set a how do we apply this transfer learning to a database data set b to create a model b because image net data set is for example is there you have already model is already trained but now you want to use that particular model in another data set to get the results that is your target let's assume then these are all the things we need to consider in our mind let's assume your uh, a data set is very larger in size and b data set is completely different properties that is also so there is no similarity between the x data set and there is no that and y data set that's called a and b are not having any similarity both are completely dissimilar in that case how to use a transfer learning so the simple thing is that try and model b from scratch initialize the weights from the model a instead of using this uh, transfer learning you can use the weights of the model a and you do the training from the scratch because a data set and b data set both are completely dissimilar but now let's assume the case where your data set a and data set b having some similarity both are having similar but number of classes might be different the visual properties are almost same then what to do thus in that case you need to just only do the fine tuning because model a is already well trained with n number of classes so model b might be having limited number of classes so simply you can do the fine, fine tuning because the model a is already well trained enough but now the case another case is the model a is trained on a smaller data set and b is having dissimilar features model a is already trained but the trained on a very smaller data set and you have a data set called b and the visual visual similarities are dissimilar there is no similarity between the two things then try in the class for using the earlier layers later layers won't help you much so in that case what are the model a is there just you take the one or two layers from the model a the rest of the uh, layers you can decide as per your requirement and both models are uh, smaller in size and both are having similar properties so there is no there is no need to train the model so it will not going to help you so depending upon the requirement and availability of the data we need to take a decision and also the model you are going to choose the model parameters you want to choose or model weights you want to choose then we also need to analyze that where that particular model was trained and what type of features it has it it learned that also we need to observe that means not only selecting a model is important and also to study where that particular model was uh, what type of data that particular model has used is also an important parameter uh, before utilizing this particular concept so these are all the few uh, 
articles which are available in the literature if you can able to see especially on the expression recognition this is completely on transfer learning models only still some of the articles you can able to see with the help of transfer learning let's try to analyze this particular article here so here transfer learning for micro expression recognition now you see so we will going to discuss more in detail about the uh, micro expressions and all uh, in, in some time but here the micro expression where this motion informations are actually required so they have in this particular article if you will observe here before using this particular features they have uh, they need to do some pre processing here so they have used this uh, motion features with the help of this op optical flow now you observe here so from here they got some of the inputs they have used a vgg16 convolution block so the as it is what are the vgg16 pre trained weights are there those weights simply they have used here to extract the expression features and at the end they have used some of the lstm that to learn the temporal uh, uh, features that is different but if you can observe here in the space to extract the spatial features they have adopted this particular vgg16 also they have used multi level features also if you will observe here here they have used only one one vgg16 but later they have used different different vgg16 modules here in three parallel streams and they have, they finally concatenated all the things together by using this vgg16 model weights as it is you can also find in the different features and here one more another paper emotion recognition on small data set using transfer learning so whenever you have a very smaller number of smaller uh, amount of data is available with you now if you will observe here instead of using instead of depending upon a single vgg16 in this article they have used both vgg16 as well as the lxnet and we knew this vgg16 and lxnet they have trained on imagenet data set now those weights they have used and tested on different data set the data sample size you can have observe here initially 28000 images they have used for the uh, training later they have tested the model on 32 images 32k and so on and at the end 1k also so here if you observe here all the things are happening on a similar data set called fer so the redundant features they might be extracted that is the, that is their approach so initially they have done this for, for first tuning and later they have done the similar thing for the second time so you can speed up the process of learning with the help of the transfer learning so you can you can if you can able to see there are many articles are there in the uh, literature this is another this is a third model which will be with this i'm going to close this uh, transfer learning which is 16 model then you use a pre-trained uh, model weights and you crop the image uh, you crop the face from a given data then what are the pre-trained weights are there then you do the fine tuning and you got this particular emotion model then you simply do the testing so the advantage of here here is you no need to train for n number of times the model will going to converge very faster if you're going to use the transfer learning now there are few other articles also there like uh, first they have uh, uh, trained their models on uh, macro expressions and those with by using those weights they have again operated on the micro expressions so if you can you can find a number of uh, transfer learning models on different different applications and one more algorithm will go to show after some time in that uh, action recognition also now what are the different applications we have and how this how we can need to develop the algorithm now if you can able to see it here image retrieval is uh, one of the um, one application where we can use in uh, many other applications also so image retrieval you have a huge amount of data is with you you would like to retrieve the relevant informations from a based on the image image query the idea is so simple like this let's assume if you, if you are going for a world tour per day you are going to take the selfies of uh, maybe 200 selfies for example per day and your world tour, is, world tour is for the 30 days so you can count how many number of images are there now you want to collect 
only your pictures from a world tour trip you might be having many many images with you as a database but you want to extract only your information one option is to do manually and other option is to just you pass your face as a query to the model and wherever your your, your face is available in a given image those pictures are going to be retrieved that is called image retrieval and this application can be used in many places like in the medical image retrieval it's going to play a very important role and uh, some commercial part also we can use this image retrieval and uh, let's assume you can able to go for this uh, amazon uh, uh, mobile app and flipkart mobile app there you can able to search the product by taking a picture just you upload a picture and relevant uh, items which are available in the amazon data set it can able to retrieve and it will go to show on your screen so there also this image retrieval applications are going to be used the another thing is called object detection and uh, classification so object recognition you can say so object detection if you will observe here here in this example we have uh, different different objects are there and few objects are moving and few objects are not at all moving so there are few static objects are there also there are movable objects also there now you that is your task to recognize what type of objects do you want to do you if we are aiming to detect an object given in a frame whether it can be static or moving that's pretty fine that is called object detection and you also want to know what that particular object is then it is object recognition you need to detect and also you want to classify then it is called object recognition uh, just i want to uh, ask you that ask you that are you able to follow me or if you have any questions please you can message me if you have any questions on uh, transfer learning you please discuss with me then we can move yeah around. you can put in the chat box or if you raise hand we will be able to yeah uh, please uh, lakshmi ji bataiye any questions participants it's okay they are saying some some one person is uh, has raised hand yeah manjunath ji please bataiye manjunath manjunath ji yeah ha uh, yeah ha uh, sir actually i wanted to ask like uh, i have taken a image from some instrument okay and trained on some feature and uh, from another instrument i take the the resolution will be different like very good resolution the same there we can use the transfer learning right like we can use the weights and all for this the features are same but hmm. they are taken from different instruments okay what was your ultimate aim and you have trained with the uh, low resolution image and you want to test on the high resolution or vice versa yes 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 like that like high resolution image like yeah, you can do that you can use the transfer learning even uh, you know not even use the transfer learning also directly you can test because the instrument properties are remain same no no okay. the instruments are different no so the it's actually high resolution image but the features are same yes we can use it you can uh, initially you can use this transfer learning weights and then you can if you require you can do the fine tuning also that is easiest way instead of okay. trying instead of training from scratch you can use yeah, the similar yeah. thing ha uh, that's what i wanted to ask yeah 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 with that we can do it yeah can we train two different problems using a single network like joint learning yes we can uh, do that and uh, some of the things we also we can discuss but how much these two problems are uh, do we have any uh, some some sort of uh, common relation between these two problems then it makes some sense or if there is no completely two dissimilar things then it will it will, then it will be a question mark single network like joint yeah. learning yeah there is another question by uh, manoj ji so i am asking you to re uh, unmute yourself manoj ji Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Sir, please. Uh, actually, sir, I have a one classification problem. Okay. I actually um, I am using some pre-trained model. Now, mm -hmm. um, in this pre-trained model, I want to reduce some. Uh, I want to. They, they have some redundancy. I, I mean, I am thinking that they have some redundancy. If I use more than one pre-trained model, so to get better classification model, sir, what to do and how to remove this pre uh, this redundancy? i didn't understand the question you have used multi uh, different different uh, models 
सर एक्चुअली हेलो यस सर सर हाउ वी कैन रिमूव द रिडेंडेंट फीचर फ्रॉम द वेरियस प्रिडेंट मॉडल लाइक इंसेप्शन वीजीजी नाइनटीन और रेस्नेट फॉर एक स्पेसिफिक क्लासिफिकेशन प्रॉब्लम No question here is like uh, suppose uh, this uh, VGC sixteen ResNet and all they have tried they have shown their efficacy on ImageNet dataset right yes sir yes sir so yes that sir. is different case because every model has uh, advantages and disadvantages suppose oh. res residual net you may you may going to get the better features but as the features are there even though it go deeper it will going to give you the better results so that is what they have already proven now coming to your application. in which in which sense you are talking about the redundancy um, uh, for the sir uh, x ray image so i want i want some um, uh, if have the some similar feature if uh, i want to detect some similar feature if this pretend model having okay um, so uh, how to remove this redundancy sir or how we can say the feature are similar feature available in in the uh, as output in from this model so actually question is not clear manojit uh, santosh ji can i uh, add here to what he is saying yes yes ma'am i am confused actually he is actually. looking ha huh, perhaps he is looking for uh, some redundancies which appear in the feature maps mm -hmm. um, and so this is uh, why do you want to in, uh, reduce redundancy is not clear to us manojit what is your purpose of reducing redundancy Ma'am, to uh, make the system uh, make a model uh, better classify uh, to better classify uh, for a particular problem domain. Like I am working on the X-ray image, so mm -hmm. uh, to better classification, I I want to identify if there is any uh, similar feature in this model. No, I think you might be trying some X model, and you might be got overfitting of it. Uh, I mean, how you how you decided that you got a redundant feature? um actually sir i want to um, um sir when i when i come, when i um, train this model uh, when i compile this model in the uh, in a in a image net they are giving some accuracy and um, now i want to uh, do some updation on that okay uh, updation okay. like you are uh, using the existing network uh, directly you have tested your model you got some x result but you want whenever yeah. you are trying to train the model you are not getting the results am i right yes sir Ah, it is not about the redundancy, because the V that is that is where this particular uh, VGC sixteen and the, we are using this transfer learning, because the VGC sixteen and uh, the models which are trained on ImageNet, they definitely can able to extract some features, because the the weights are trained enough to extract the features. So whenever you are using those weights mm -hmm. for your data set, it is giving some X percentage. Maybe it might be good or bad. but if you want to do the same model from the scratch training it will give it may going to give you the zero zero percentage of improvement are you going to get the same problem right yes sir ah because your data is not sufficient enough to train the okay. model that can be the first case or the second case is that network is not not suitable for your application because not necessarily all the uh, popular networks if you if you'll going to train from scratch may going to give you the results Mm, yes sir okay that that problem is there that is the reason we are going to develop an individual networks as per our application you may can use initial two layers or initial three layers of the vgc 16 or any features you can use those weights then you can able to do this particular uh, uh, fine tuning and so on that you can do it yeah. okay this is very sir. quite common problem but it uh, is not a redundant problem yeah so uh, santosh there are a couple of other questions also some people have raised hand and some have written here so yes, nizamuddin ji will you uh, unmute yourself please i am uh, requesting you to unmute yourself uh, thank you madam uh, sir i have designed a, a model for recognizing a motion uh, mm -hmm. using uh, cnn and stn and it gives a 72% result on fer 2013 data set but i want to test uh, this on jf and ck plus data set to um, sir problem kya hai ki kya mere ko model badalna padega ya fir mere ko us data model ko fer 2000 ki 
के बराबर लाना पड़ेगा सो so देट मैं मॉडल ना चेंज करूं और मेरे दूसरे मॉडल उस पर ट्रेन होकर के टेस्टिंग में कर सकूं एक्सप्रेशन एक्सप्रेशन रिकॉग्निशन का बात कर रहे हैं जी सर यू हैव टेस्टेड योर मॉडल ऑन एफ ई आर टू थाउजेंड थर्टी टू थाउजेंड ओके एफ ई आर चैलेंज यू हैव ट्रेन द मॉडल बट यू आर ट्राइंग टू डू द क्रॉस डाटा वैलिडेशन विद सीके प्लस राइट सर राइट सर एंड योर 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 द द परफॉर्मेंस वाज डिग्रेडेड राइट नो सर अभी हो नहीं पा रहा सेवेंटी टू परसेंट के लिए मॉडल बनाया हुआ था एफ ई आर टू थाउजेंड थर्टीन के ऊपर मॉडल बना हुआ था सर बट अब सी के प्लस के ऊपर टेस्ट करना था जेफी के ऊपर टेस्ट करना था तो क्या चेंज करना पड़ेगा इनपुट लेने के लिए नो 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 एक्चुअल सी द क्वेश्चन हेयर इज आई थिंक यू माइट बी टेकन ए नेटवर्क विच इज ऑलरेडी ट्रेंड ऑन द एफ ई आर टू थाउजेंड थर्टीन राइट यस इमेजेस only. डिपेंडिंग अपॉन दैट यू हैव टू चेंज द सीके प्लस आल्सो इनपुट साइज आपको कम करना पड़ेगा ओके सर बिकॉज़ लॉजिक इज सो सिंपल यू हैव ट्रेंड एक्स मॉडल विद सम प्रॉपर्टीज बाय पासिंग इमेज एज अ स्मॉलर साइज इमेज बट यू आर ट्राइंग टू टेस्ट विद अ बिगर साइज इमेज योर मॉडल विल नॉट गोइंग टू ट्रेंड डाइमेंशनल टिश्यू दैट द डाइमेंशन एंड दैट इज अ सीएस सीएसवी फाइल एंड अदर इज नॉट इन फॉर्मेट ऑफ द फाइल कैन बी एनीथिंग but a given input size should be matched if you if you are yes, using yes, a, a, a 112 cross 112 size image size you are using then you know testing also you have to use the same size yes sir yeah yes, that sir. you so, have so, to okay so so i am going to change the uh, size of image for each and every pictures in no, uh, other data set change the features just you need to suppose let's assume ck plus data size uh, 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 image size is 100 cross 100 let's assume okay but your model has trained with the image size of 48 cross 48 for example yes sir yes but you want to test on 100 cross 100 image you cannot able to do it so you have to resize this 100 cross 100 image to 48 cross 48 then you need to test okay sir what whether the results will be good or bad that is a secondary issue but mm-hmm. this is a procedure we need to follow but especially okay. on this but i think i guess you might be followed some paper or article where they were trying to work on the tiny size images generally expression image size is not that 48 cross 48 okay sir okay thank you so next can we go to uh, femina shiba uh, please ask your question last question then we can go ahead I think you, yeah yeah. Uh, I think you almost answered. Uh, I have a problem where uh, I have a small uh, data set uh, for my uh, medical images because what uh, for that condition we cannot get uh, many images as this, those patients will be very less. So in that case uh, we can uh, have this transfer knowledge where we can have a model uh, so that transferred to. the smaller data set will that work correctly suppose you you want to uh, use the model for the smaller amount data set yeah data set is small now so uh, with the smaller data set with the complete with the cnn uh, model i am not able to get the uh, good accuracy yeah have you done this augmentation but uh, yeah yeah i have i've already done the segmentation object identification but my accuracy is not that very good because my data set itself is small very the small. training data set yeah so can we use uh, 
this is this transfer knowledge for that uh, if you have uh, uh, some uh, if you have any models which are trained on similar type of data set which is trained on big data set maybe you can use this transfer learning concept oh we have to have a similar Okay. Some, some some similarity is required, right? Because the model has to learn some features. Whatever yeah. the application you might be using, you should okay. know what type of those features. So if you are not having the exact similar application, but nearby application, maybe you can use it. Okay. There are many papers on this. Medical imaging, especially for the smaller data set, there are many papers we can able to get okay. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, image classification model can be used to... Uh, for image segmentation using transfer learning yeah see uh, this is an interesting question you can uh, use it but for that you need to go for the image classification model then you have to freeze the weights and you need to use uh, uh, train the uh, upsampling model only you need to train that also we can able to use it but the necessary changes you need to take care you have to uh, while changing the model then you have to take the necessary modifications we can do that okay and vice versa also we can do like uh, uh, you, you might be trying your model for the segmentation and if you want to use it for the classification then only the encoder portion you can take it and you can uh, uh, you, uh, you can go for the fine tuning and so on that we can do it if you have uh, some similar applications we can do that thank you and especially on recent articles if you'll observe especially they are trying to integrating two models uh, with the help of GAN, they are generating in images and in the latent features that is called uh, latent features, nothing but uh, uh, before doing the upsampling, once you do the encoding features, then you're trying to do the decoding features. So the end of the encoding and the starting of the decoding that is called latent, ve latent vector. So those features, you can use it for the further classification. So if you can able to see many, many papers, they are using this also. Yes, we can do that also. Okay. Then, um, I, I think. Yeah, I think you can go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, fine. If you have any further questions, you can again uh, raise your hand. We can we can discuss further more. Now, the, another interesting problem uh, is called image captioning here. So, till now, in the previous case, we have discussed about uh, uh, on a single application, maybe image or video. Now, we can integrate the two different uh, models together are two different concepts together to solve one particular problem that is called image captioning here so if you'll observe here it is an image you need to give an caption because uh, giving an annotation for a particular data is also one of the challenging case so here we are trying to make this image captioning based on your model has to understand what this particular image is so in this particular image what can, how you can able to give a name how you can able to naming this particular image because there is a, a green background it can be like a ground there is a football and there is a skid so there are three things which are three words are there one is a, a ground kid and football by combining three words we need to form a sentence that is called a kid is playing a football so this is a, something called image captioning if you look if you can observe here from a given input data we are going to recognizing what this particular objects which are presenting in a given image. So background you have detected that is like a ground, a kid you have detected kid, one uh, ball you have detected that is called football, right? Ground is a word, uh, kid is a word and uh, ball is a word. By combining these three, we are going to form a sentence. So here we need to integrate the two concepts together that is called image processing and natural language processing. By integrating these two, we can come to a uh, conclusion that is image captioning. What are the applications are there? We will discuss. You try to observe here. This is a this is a this is our campus, MNIT, uh, the MNIT campus where we have tested our model with this. I hope you're going to uh, de uh, detect some mistakes here. So if you'll observe here, it is almost uh, 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 trying to capturing each and every frame here in this example. But there is a small mistakes which 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 this particular algorithm is giving. So observe this: a man standing on a beach holding an umbrella. So man is he is walking, but it is a frame-wise analysis. So he's standing is correct. 
holding an umbrella is also correct but standing on a beach is a wrong thing but now if you observe here we have tested this particular uh, uh, model on publicly available data but we have tested with completely unseen data so this particular scenario which I have not even seen by our model during the training but if if i want to test the same model in the unseen environment it is almost giving the 90 percent of the accuracy but the 10 percent is because of this mistake of uh, seeing a beach so why it is recognizing it is a beach because the sand in the training model wherever the sand is there the corresponding sentences which are available during the training was a beach so that is the reason this captioning in uh, uh, this particular video captioning this uh, algorithm is going to give a beach in between the sentences so this is this is how we can able to train our uh, model here from a given input data you can use some of the cnn models so that you can able to detect the number of objects which are present so from there you can able to get some of the features from the uh, for given input data we have some uh, some uh, co corresponding sentences are with us during the training because for each uh, testing data each training data we have corresponding uh, captions are available we also need to train by joining these two so from by using word embodding for the training data we can get some features you integrate these two then you further train so that you can able to get the overall result for the image captioning to compare an object that must be present in database of yes because here whatever the image is there the corresponding captions are also available in the training how you can able to know how you can able model model to know what that particular image contains so somewhere we need to provide the proper captioning information also so by 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 using the proper data then only we can able to test right so as yes as, as per your question yes we for which application you are trying to develop a model the corresponding captions also required from where we can get this data yeah that is a nice question for the image captioning and uh, image uh, uh, questioning answering we have well defined data sets are already publicly available you can uh, search in uh, github and you, where you can able to get information or you can uh, 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 check these corresponding papers on uh, <clears throat> google you will going to get the information there are many publicly available data sets there but ha huh, if you want to customize this particular captioning or questioning answer system for your application then you need to create the data and you need to create the corresponding captioning information during the testing uh, training sorry yes that we need to do if you want to do something for customization for as per your requirement you need to do it <coughs> okay now you see this particular image for easy understanding of image captioning here so this is a picture where we have n number of crowds n, n number of uh, objects are available here the, the there is a woman she is holding a camera and there is a, a woman wearing a purple jacket and she is holding a camera and this is a crowd so first we need to direct the recognize the number of objects so once you recognize this is the uh, object information you got it woman crowd cat camera holding and purple now you form a sentences so you can able to get the n number of sentences then use the ranking which sentence is more appropriate to you then you can able to give a proper caption there is called a woman holding a camera in a crowd so similarly we can apply these particular things to n number of applications depending upon your requirements and now this particular concept is further extended to visual questioning answering this is also one of the interesting problem much research has already done in this particular field you can find out more number of good articles in this also so here what is the malicious made of you know this first you need to recognize what is the malicious here and you need to recognize what the particular object is here the object is a banana with the banana the malicious made of right so such type of things also we can able to do it now coming to the expression expression so if you'll observe here these are all the few expression data set, that, uh, expressions are available with us that's called universal expression you can call it as so here if I, by seeing a face itself you can uh, recognize what what that particular uh, uh, girl is trying to express so by seeing the uh, picture itself you can able to say she is happy right 
But the question comes here is uh, whether she is uh, really happy or she is uh, whether it's a real debt, a real expression or a fake expression. That is a second discussion, but this is called expression. This is called macro expressions. Why these particular ex uh, expressions are somewhat uh, important? If you can able to see, this is a C. Here, these are the people who are the sports persons and uh, who are the, might be a singers from the from the birth. They may not able to see and learn the things, but still they can give the exact same expression like us. So now she, you can able to see. This, well, I mean, uh, some impaired uh, persons can also express the same expressions like a. The, the persons who have already having a uh, who can learn something by seeing right so they can able to smile they can able to uh, feel happy and so on so expressions are with, within us but how we can able to fake it that is different issue so with the help of this we can uh, uh, estimate some true emotions also true expressions also so this particular application is called macro and further we can uh, extend this to micro as well and it is having many number of applications so that is all up to you you can use it this application for an your requirement like you learning police testimony online shopping medical diagnosis gaming and so on and classroom group behavior and these are all the fields where we can uh, use this particular expressions and there is a, another thing now you try to observe here if you see this video could you able to find out any of the variations? It's a it's a live video which is going on. I mean, see, it is a video, recorded video. But if you will see here, you can find nothing. But you try to observe the variations here. Yeah. At this level, you see then the minute variations are minute variations you can able to observe, right? So you, you can observe the minute variations. But if you can able to see in a global view, everything looks very similar. Now you try to observe here. Can you recognize what type of expression she is having? So here the same expression which is spreaded across. The single expression which is spreaded across. This is called the micro expressions. She is happy. Here you can able to see the, there is a small a change in the lips. Similarly, you can able to see this particular expression, except this eyes, everything looks similar, right? So this is called micro expression. That means the variations which are going to happen only for minute interval of time. So this is called micro expressions this is very challenging field of research to work. So as here, expressions are, in this case, the face where we have, we can have uh, minimum variations, and also we have minimum number of data. Um, uh, the number of samples which are available in data sets are very limited. Then how to train our models. These are all the few uh, articles which we, for some articles we can discuss here. <clears throat> so you can able to see this is one of the shallow, this is one of the uh, shallow network where we can also customize some layers. So in the beginning, somebody asked, how to how to decide how how many number of layers are required so not necessarily you need to i mean there is no such parameter as per my observation there is no such parameter is there to define the number of parameter number of layers the number of layers and the selection of filters are purely depending upon the application and the experimentation but you can customize the layers. Yes, we can customize our own layers depending upon our requirement. Let's assume if you'll observe here. So here from a given input data, initially we have used five cross five, then three cross three. Then there some X suite features the others have proposed. What that particular X suite will go on to do? We try to observe here. This is an X suite. So from a given input data, that means from here, the three cross three responses we are uh, here feeding as the input to this particular X suite to try to observe the X suite here. Here the X suite is one cross one, three cross three, five cross three, five and seven cross seven. So multi scale features are there. In a standard, in, if you can able to see the uh, standard operations of uh, convolutions here, 
the previous responses are simply going to be added simple the previous response like one cross one three cross three five cross five seven cross seven simply you can add all the things together two options either you can add or you can able to concatenate so if you can able to add it so if you you observe this is the response you will going to get it but here the other have done their own uh, way of analysis here instead of going to use a simply addition they have done some analysis within the multi-scale features where out of these four they have taken a minimum feature and also they have taken a maximum response that means from one cross one at a position at a one cross one uh, conversion operation some residual field came response came similarly after three cross three one response after five cross five one response seven cross seven one response so total four resultant features you got it right instead of simply summing of of uh, summing of all four you can select required features from out of these four to select those things <clears throat> in this article they have used out of four maximum pixel and out of four minimum pixel then they have taken an average out of it and that average response they have added to the previous response so instead of simply adding all the four they have taken the some uniform informations and they have taken the extreme edge informations at that particular location and if you can able to see this electo layers by following this particular strategy you can able to see the different features so depending upon uh, your application you can also design some modules you can you might be seen most of the papers they have proposed they might be proposed that in in their article they propose some customized module and that particular module might be performed better in this in their applications and this is a, another uh, article article if you can observe here this is a very shallow and small network this is a, this almost 1 million parameter network so here using this layers is also one option so if you can able to observe here 7 cross 7 and uh, uh, red one is uh, 3 cross 3 so 7 cross 7 and 3 cross 3 filters uh, uh, extracted from a given input data then the responses are going to be added from the resultant response again they have done 5 cross 5 and 1 cross 1 and this is this is called one block that is called high feed block and the same block in their article they have repeated three times and if you'll go for the if you'll read those articles you can uh, reduce uh, re reduce these blocks by two or you can you can uh, repeat this block by four five and so on depending upon the application so in this article they have done some ablation study also by uh, repeating uh, by by uh, removing the stack of uh, three by two and increase by stack by four and five also so if you'll observe here these are all the features you may can get it as we have discussed if you can go for the sequential approach here in this example the information may go into loose instead of going in a sequential manner i want to go in a bit deeper but also i need to maintain my features so this is somewhat pictorial visualization of the problem from a given input data first extract the three cross three then seven cross seven you got some two different features then you then you add those two features then then pass this feature as an input to the next response that is called one cross one and five cross one and at the end you can able to fuse these two and you can repeat this operation three times by following a sequential by using this uh, high uh, high net the information can be preserved before going to the fully connector if you have any questions on this please you can discuss guys if you have any question please discuss uh, rise uh, participants you again can raise hands one or two questions you would like to take seems there are no questions okay. here you okay. can go ahead so there will be an another architecture where you can able to see it here so if you'll observe here this is different architecture now that's all up to us how we can able to design our network now you observe here let me give you the basic difference again with the other approaches like in the uh, popular networks like vgc 16 19 resnet and so on initially their uh, in those articles, if you observe, the initial filters are 64 filters, 
32 filters, 128 filters, and so on, right? So for the application like express recognition, using many number of filters may not going to help us. Second observation, even though you're using a 64 filters, it doesn't mean that all the 64 filters may going to learn. So some of the filters may going to learn, some of the filters may not going to learn, right? To make all the filters learn, that is, that is how this dropout concept came. But if you're gonna observe here, 64 filters instead of using in a uh, 64 filters at a per same depth, we have uh, divided that 64 filters into four streams, parallel streams, 16, 16, 16, 16. So here, if you can able to observe here, there are four 16 filters, that means 64 divided into four parallel streams. And you observe here at this location, the first, res first resultant response of first filter are combined with the second uh, parallel layer response. Similarly, third and fourth, fourth level responses are again added with the third level responses and the operation is repeated for two times. So this is also one of the very sh uh, shallow let network, very lightweight network. This is also having uh, 1.4 parameter, 1.4 million parameters, I guess. So this is a one article if you'll observe. So what was the intuition behind this particular algorithm? The intuition here is, please explain about the fusion mode. Okay, I'll, I'll explain about the, how different type of filter uh, merging works and what is the resultant filter size would be. Okay. Okay, I'll give you one intuition for that particular question. Okay, let me complete this. I'll I'll come back to that. So observe here, uh, 16 filters, 16, and here combining, you try to observe this particular uh, visualization. There you will get to know. So this is the first, first. This is first, second, third, fourth, right? So observe here from a given input data. This is the first 16 responses which we have got it from the first layer. So in 16, some of the filters have learned better and some of the filters not learn from a given, given input data. This is the second 16 level responses like this. This is the first one and this is the second one. So in the 16, few filters have extracted the features and few filters may fail. But if we can able to combine these two responses together, the resultant response is something like this, right? So these responses are required for us to learn our model. If you if you can keep on trying to learn on this because here everything is a bit uniform, it will not going to learn. The resultant values will become zero, and you 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 will not going to the model will not going to converse properly. So by adding this, we can able to preserve the features. So this is the actual intuition of this. So from if you can simply following this, the features may not going to learn, the model may not able to learn, but by combining that fusing this type of two layer responses and repeating this operation to the further, by reaching the fully connected, the information can be preserved. So this is a, will it add first with the first, second with second and so on? No, it is not about first with first. Uh, okay, I think I will try to write here. For your easy reference, I'm trying to write, this is the first parallel response. This is the second, this one is third, this one is fourth. Now you observe here, here I have used 16 filters, initially 16 filters I have used, here also 16. Instead of using 64 filters in the beginning, we have uh, used this parallel stream networks here. Instead of instead of sequentially using uh, 64 in a single position, we have used, we have split it into four streams and each stream we are trying to get the responses. So once your model has trained from the 16 filters, you got 16 responses here. From the second, we got again 16 responses. Depending upon the properties of the filter, here you can able to get 16 different things and here you can able to get the 16 different things. And now you see here, this is the first response here, four plus four. So here the some of the filters might be not learned properly. It is learned, but it is not properly visible. So now here. Similarly, in another uh, second level 16 filters, you can able to see these are all the responses which are not learned. But now see, here this is not learned, but here it is learned. Here it is not learned, but here it is learned. 
So if I can able to combine these two together, this filter as well, if I combine 16 out of 16, I may going to get it. See, only one thing here also not learned and here also not learned. So the result and response you didn't get here. But the rest of the things you got it. So this merging we need to do. That means we should have some uh, some our ultimate goal of designing any of the network is to your model has to properly learn and it should give the better results for your application but how to design a network is the first question how to design a network is the first question therefore we need to use such type of analysis so visualization is also one of the important thing to uh, while designing now coming to your first another question that how different types of filters merging works here now, if you'll observe here, this uh, previous previous thing here, no. So here the intuition here is so simple. Let's consider this is your eyebrow. This is your eyebrow, right? In your face, this is eyebrow, upper portion is the skin and lower portion is the skin. You're trying to use a three class three filters. Let's assume three class three filter. So the three cross filter is small filter, which is going to occupy this particular eyebrow region itself. That means within the eyebrow region, what are the information can be extracted? So as its eyebrow is uh, itself is occupied three cross three, there you can able to get the uniform response. But at this location, if you want to go for the five cross five, either the upper skin portion and the eyebrows can be covered or eyebrows with the lower, lower skin portion can be covered. There is a chance of getting an edges at this location as well so depending upon your requirement do i need to go for the three cross three filters or five cross five or seven cross seven and also you need to say you, you analyze that if you are going to use only three cross three only nine parameters supposed to be learned if it is a five cross five you need to go for the 25 number of parameters if it is seven cross seven it's more number of parameters but here the thing is like as per your application what type of uh, features you are trying to extract based on that you need to go for the filter selection third one now here as uh, the question here is how to merge them how to merge them because if you apply this uh, image here, let's assume image is 100 cross 100 and uh, 100 cross 100 if you are going to use a three cross six convolution without padding the result and response is 98 cross 98 am i right if you're going to go for the five cross filter, it is something like 96 cross 96. So you cannot able to simply merge these two because the output of three cross will become 98 cross 98. Output of five cross filter will become 96 cross 96. So you cannot able to simply add them together. In such situations, you need to be ensure the feature response dimensionality also you need to ensure. That means you may you may need to require to use padding operations. At three class, you don't want to use padding, then five class five, you need to go for the padding. Therefore, the result and response size will be equal to 98 plus 98. So those decisions you need to take while developing a network. So here you can able to observe the things. If you can able to extract different, different features here, you can able to get the overall uh, overall uh, uh, edge information from a given phase is clear now you observe here from here and here i hope you are clear on this or any, any specific questions please you can discuss any questions so will it add first oh no okay we have already discussed okay fine <clears throat> if you have any question please raise your hand so this is uh, one article. It is in uh, translation image processing. If anybody interested, you can uh, explore on this. No, this is uh, uh, another uh, article. Uh, article here also you can able to see different uh, network designing uh, strategies which are adapted. So you may can ask that the previous network part we have discussed it may not going to perform well in this another application it is a similar application but here the things are different but in this application we need to extract some of the uh, motion information also not only spatial also we need to consider some of the temporal variations so 
the active imaging some concept we have which you have used by these others and the result and response they have used the shallow network because the ultimate target of this particular application is to design a lightweight and shallow networks and this this paper got accepted in uh, IJCNN conference the Korea Korea conference so there you can uh, there you can uh, test these models so here you can able to see this is a one this is one very small network three cross c and five cross y only two filters which they have used and repeated for three times very small uh, network where uh, three cross and five cross y they have used and uh, uh, combined and repeated for three times this is on expressions and there are many many articles that you can if anybody interested you can explore on this and the third one which we can go for this uh, um, change reduction that is called a moving object detection concepts here so in this example if you can able to observe this is a standard uh, standard way of solving the problem so in in this particular standard way here see this is a video clip here where you want to segment only the moving objects if anything which is uh, uh, non moving is a stationary you can consider them as a background information because here the floor is a background so you don't need to specifically detect them here the cars are moving and here the persons are walking and the person is trying to uh, hold his bag or removing her keeping his bag down right so you need to segment the only the uh, changes which are happening with respect to time that is called moving objects now in recent times there are a few other articles also available uh, doing the similar tasks with the bonding boxes this particular concept we can discuss later on in further sessions so let's let's discuss some of the article designings on this particular change detections <clears throat> and this is the further applications of video analytics where we can use this particular segmentation and the bonding box concepts in other few applications also uh, those applications are something like this uh, intrusion detection and the traffic monitoring this is one of the interesting problem of traffic monitoring where you can also find out the abnormal driving behaviors here so also you can find out the not only traffic uh, monitoring you can also observe the if there is any abnormal driving behaviors are there you can able to detect them also so here the person is not giving any particular indicator but still they are trying to uh, change the lane in this particular traffic condition so it's the abnormal abnormal behavior now this is another interesting problem of violence detection um, see here how you can able to define the violence violence is depending upon the actions right here the person is holding uh, wearing a mask covering his face and he's trying to uh, aim a gun towards a shopkeeper right so as the person is trying to hold a gun and this particular this posture and this this action and the object which he is holding based on this we can able to say there, there may be a violent activity is going on so you can able to detect the violence but the same case may not go into true in other conditions that let's assume he the same action is appearing in a uh, gun shop itself then can we say it is a violence activity so in this case this particular action and the detecting this particular object combining these two we can say that this is a violence detection but the same uh, same uh, algorithm may fail whenever the during the background the shop itself is a gun shop because there he might be testing it is a normal activity so violence detection is an application where we can work and which is interesting problem but there the background information is also an important parameter to take a final decision so integrating different different solutions we can able to take the final call and this is the anomaly detection is one of the interesting problem so here the first challenging problem is defining the anomaly so defining an anomaly is the first challenging problem once you are clear about the defining the anomaly then we can able to make the we can run our algorithms and uh, regular video surveillances where we can uh, use this particular forensic analysis purposes only and the third one is like uh, crowd monitoring especially in our covid situations this is one of, one of the interesting uh, uh, problem where people are working that is called crowd monitoring in this area already before also working but during this pandemic it is much attracted field and it is having many challenges also now in the crowd monitoring we, by using the crowd monitoring also we can take the decision of whether the uh, whether, is there any anomalous activities happened or not 
because in in a particular shopping mall, let's assume the crowd has gathered where to uh, um, uh, to participate in a con uh, in in concert. It is a normal activity, but the crowd has gathered where there may be a small uh, accident or anything. Then it is an anomalous activity. So analyzing the crowd, we also we can able to further. Uh, Classify whether the act where in, in the particular location the activity is an anomalous activity or normal activity. So that also we can work. And the another interesting problems are here in the object detection, if you'll observe. So there are many uh, good algorithms are there in the object detection as on a regular use. And there is an another algorithms are also available that is called from the aerial view because here the challenges are completely different. So here the objects are going to be detected with the help of these bonding boxes. So you can able to observe the green color uh, uh, square or rectangular boxes here. You can observe here. So here the bounding box is going to say what type of an object it is here. With the help of bounding boxes, we are going to uh, detecting the objects. So <clears throat> the algorithm perform better in this uh, in in left side may not going to perform good results in the right side and vice versa. So the reasons here is, if you'll observe here, in the left side in the regular view, a box which is going to occupy a bigger size, I mean, sorry, here the object in a frame is occupying more space as compared to the right side. So here one bigger bounding box is required to detect one particular object in the left side. But in the right side, as these objects are very smaller in size because it is from the aerial view, to detect an object, you need a small bonding box. So if you'll observe the same, if you use this particular right side algorithm on the left side, the small bonding box is not even covering a 2% of the car. So these algorithms may not going to perform well and vice versa. If, if, you're gonna, if you can able to use the bigger bonding box strategies on this example, so one bonding box is going to cover more than <coughs> five or six objects. So that is how there are few uh, researchers are trying to develop an algorithm which is going to balancing these factors. So the same algorithm is supposed to work in the aerial view as well as on the regular view. And there are a few more also algorithms are available to further handle the challenges during the uh, detecting the objects like low intensity in the lightning conditions and all those things we can discuss in later things so this is the aim of the algorithms to detect the objects from the aerial view let's talk about one of the network architecture and how the changes of the architectures are happening in this particular field of change detection or uh, um, moving object segmentation concepts so this is one paper in 2018 this is one algorithm where you can able to see from a moving object detection first the people have uh, uh, estimated the backgrounds first because once you know the background you can uh, subtract the current frame if information is uh, similar then uh, difference will be zero if there is any dissimilarity you make an estimate that there may be a motion is involved in it Right. So this is one algorithm where uh, people have done some um, uh, background estimated manually with the help of uh, conventional approaches that is called temporal median. And those uh, then and those techniques have passed through some small encoder decoder network. So the encoder decoder network is something like this it is one of the uh, small network. <sighs> So further, and they have tested their models on uh, one of the popular data set called CDNet 2014 data set. So they have divided this data into a training and testing. So from where you can observe that the data has uh, seen dependent or independent. This is one algorithm of seen dependent data. But the same, uh, uh, but in this algorithm limitation here is they have used a temporal median as an input. So that means it is depending upon the traditional approach as well, right? Further, the say, uh, so from the uh, from the similar group, there was an uh, alternative approach they have proposed in one of the iterative transaction. Uh, this is the first algorithm in the field of change detection, moving object detection. The as per the article, 
it is the first algorithm where they have produced a complete end to end solution input to output without using any of the uh, handcrafted approaches in between so the idea is something like this if you can observe here you can observe here first one is first we need to estimate the background the estimation of the background you can you can apply in any application wherever you wish to do it the concept of estimating background is remain same so first we need to estimate the background so from a given input sequence of here they have taken the input sequence of 50 frames from a 50 frames they have come down to one frame <coughs> now from the one frame they need to estimate the saliency motion saliency motion means from an estimated background do we have any changes are there in the, our current frames so they have subtracted these input features from the estimated background so in order to subtract they have used a concept called replicated layer here so here the background is estimated as one single frame then they have repeated this particular single frame to 50 number of times that is called a replicate replica layer then they concatenated the current input frames with the replicated layer alternatively then they have gone for the differential layer so that from a <clears throat> current frame whatever the model you have estimated you take the difference between these two so that you may be able to get the changes if you find out some changes that means there is a motion is involved so they have used this uh, differential la layer then they have gone for the max pulling then they have do the encoder decoder so encoder decoder remains similar concept but here this is the first algorithm in the field of change reduction where they have provided a complete end to end solution <coughs> to solve the particular problem and of course this model also they have tested on uh, uh, 2019 uh, sorry cdnet 2019 data set but the problem here in this example is like the content they have used for the training and the content used for the testing are having similar properties that was a drawback but otherwise this is the first article in in this particular field of change detection as per the as per this particular others claim <clears throat> further to avoid this type of problems we need to uh, uh, propose or we need to develop an algorithm which has to work perfectly on the unseen environments that means whenever you're going to train our model on a seen environments and testing your model on the unseen environments there are many technical issues are there so in order to surpass that issues people have uh, implemented some models on the uh, seen dependent environment but that's, that is not supposed to be the case we, sh we should follow so this is one algorithm where uh, they have proposed a completely unseen environment and also they proposed the limitations and all. This is the article you may can go for it. Seen independency matter is desirable transaction paper. So here, if you observe here, the background need to be estimated. So in order to estimate the background, here they have proposed one model called MMSR block. As I said, you can customize your filters and you can customize your uh, <clears throat> modules and that module specifically going to perform something as per your your application so in this example they have used this multi-scale features of one class one three class three and five class five but here they have not even neither concatenated nor they have uh, added instead of these three they have extracted the max out of these three neither concatenation nor added simply they have picked out the maximum value at that particular location from these particular three filters so at a depending upon the properties maybe sometimes the five cross five will go to give the maximum value sometimes the one plus one may give something three cross three so here the intuition here is to extract the maximum out of the given input filters they have taken this max operation that's called mmsr so mmsr is nothing but maximum multi-spatial receptive features and they repeated this operation for three times to estimate the background now the question comes here is here the input sequence is 50 you are trying to get a single output how to come down to 50 to 1 because is a temporal depth is also an important parameter here so here they have gradually reduced the depth that is called drb that is called a depth reductionistic background estimator so you need to reduce the depth of these particular frames with the help of the filters so that you can end up with a single convolution operation so that you can able to estimate a background. 
Now, from a given input uh, uh, 51 frame, you can consider as input frame so that you need to estimate the changes that's called salience information. So, in this article, they have used the same MS, MMSR block here. And these two are going to be concatenated here because the estimated background and uh, information which is uh, coming from the uh, input frame and there is a temporal median. You combine all these three together, that is called CFA, course feature assimilator block, and you pass it to the encoder decoder. So, this is a pictorial visualization of this particular module here. As I said, the DRB depth reduction is block background estimator. <clears throat> here, this is a temporal sequence history frames. First time MSR, so you can able to see here, there is a changes here, you can observe in the first uh, uh, first MSR block, wherever the changes are there, edges and all, you can able to find out. Later on, we are trying to slowly smoothing these filters in such a way that the only the background information is supposed to be preserved. So the, in order to smoothing this, we have repeated this operation for three times, tested the model with four times also. The, this those things you can able to check in the evolution study. So here the filters you have repeated for three times. So ultimately you got this particular uh, background. See from a current frame uh, the similar features of MMSR. So you can able to get the foreground and you combine and you can able to get the contrast feature assimilation. And these features you can able to further pass it to the encoder decoder. Now in the similar uh, uh, flow there is an, another article uh, and yeah so. Okay, this is a this is a first article which I actually clearly given the uh, technical differences in the existing articles and uh, what are the uh, what is the solution supposed to be followed. You can able to uh, find in this particular article. So this is another article uh, which is a published in a transaction image processing. This is a, a completely three D CD. Three D CNN model model has used here to uh, to. Uh, uh, estimate the uh, to segment the forward information. So there they have used uh, GRB block that is called gradual uh, uh, reduction background estimator and FSR is called uh, for foreground saliency response here. Now you observe here from the 3D here instead of using a spatial uh, temporal pooling here they have used a, a spatial pooling here in this case they have used a temporal pooling concept. Because here we cannot able to do this particular spatial pooling, so they have used the temporal pooling concept here. Initially, they have used the 50 filters, then they have done the temporal pooling with five, they come down to 10 filter or temporal depth of 10. Then they have done the temporal pooling of two, so that they come with the five filters. Then they have done a temporal pooling of one, so uh, temporal pooling of five, they have end up with the one filter. So this is also gradually they have reduced the temporal depth of the uh, input features to a single feature because uh, in it, they, we need to estimate the background from a given sequence. So the salience information, as I said earlier, all, earlier discussed, we need whatever the model you have estimated, simply you can able to take the subtraction from the current frame. So whenever you are trying to take the subtraction from the current frame, you can get the changes that is called CMF, coarse motion features. But there may be a chance of noise can also be can be detected because noise, whenever you're trying to take the difference, the noise can also be available or some, some unwanted information can also be available in order to further remove that. They have done this further convolution operations. So that from a given input data, some convolution operations and from the CMF, again, they got the convolution operations. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, yeah, second convolution operations. So whenever you are going to do this convolution operations on the saliency map information, the noise and all unwanted information may go into surpass so that the actual true change information can be preserved. So this is the purpose of this FSR. So here you can able to see this, uh, uh, the, the ultimate aim is to get the uh, motion information that's called coarse motion feature we need to extract. But as I discussed that there is a information can be having a noise or unwanted information to remove that surpasses that we, they have done some convolution operations to smoothing this information. And further you can uh, see this, they also proposed uh, the extended version of the encoder decoders here. Uh, in the literature, if you can see most of the works, they have used this multi-scale, uh, multi-layer uh, 
parallel stream networks in the encoder but in the decoder they have used single stream but in this article they have uh, used this uh, to maintain the similarity they have followed this uh, um, uh, multi stream networks here in the encoder also in the decoder yeah if you'll observe here so uh, here the what are the multi scale features they got it they have used some residual connections so that the features can be preserved or learned if you observe here, here in the decoder, wherever you have got this multi-scale filters, they combine here. So those the all the combined features we, we may not able to use it for the testing. To check the accuracy, you need a single image from a given input image uh, from a given input sequence X. You need to generate the X prime. But as you're trying to combining here, the noise information also present. So in order to further surpass this, they have again used the Two more convolution operations here so that the information can be smooth the only the forward information can be preserved with that intuition again the cfd model has introduced here at the just before the uh, decoder output so these are all the in these are all the theoretical approaches we need to use before developing any of the network architecture If anybody working on this particular area, to if you want to know more details on this, please visit my website where you can able to get this all the information, and you will get some of the review articles also in this particular field. And there we have we have suggested the uh, limitations and uh, advantages, disadvantages, and so on. Who are newcomer for them, it can be useful. So this is one uh, pictorial visualization you can observe here from a temporal sequence. We have estimated the background. From the background, we need to estimate the uh, coarse motion features so that the subtraction of uh, estimated background and current frame. <clears throat> From a coarse motion features, we have again done this particular encoder decoder. You got some output after applying this uh, CFD because fine tuning of the responses, you have completely we have end up with the results foreground information. So as I, as I stated that here, the change in from that. Um, the object detection or moving object detection this is a conventional way of solving it. so there was a new type of an uh, algorithm which is available that is called mor that is called moving object recognition concept that means you can detect the bounding boxes you can detect the moving objects not with the uh, uh, pixelized binary segmentation strategies but using these bounding boxes so this is a new algorithm so that you can able to uh, you can uh, use these algorithms at your customized environment so this is the first article in this particular field to provide a solution with the help of bounding boxes moving object detection with the help of bounding boxes we're going to discuss this in, in later classes so another interesting problem where we can just i'll give you the brief uh, uh, overview that is called anomaly detection so in the anomaly detection, if you'll observe, here also we can here also a few articles are there with the help of transfer learning. In the anomaly detection, what is meant by anomaly? Anomaly is nothing but something which is not having a normal behavior. So if you'll observe here, it is following some normal behavior, but at a particular time, there is a sudden peak. So this sudden peak is a not a normal behavior. So it is an anomalous activity. So it is an anomalous behavior. So we need to develop an algorithm so that we can able to detect the anomalous activities in a given data as i said anomalous activity is one of the biggest issue now now you combine uh, compare these two images which one is anomalous to you so this is also uh, boxing and this is also one type of uh, this is also fighting with boxing and this is also um, the action is also like a boxing but here this in the right side it is an anomalous activity but on the left side it is a normal activity why the reason here is not the action the here the reason here is the where this particular action is uh, happening so in this left side image the action is happening in a boxing ring so this particular thing is a normal action but the similar action is happening on the metro train then it was an anomalous activity so in the anomalous thing which we need to un also analyze that the uh, where this what is the action and where it is occurring so in order to understand where it is occurring, the background is also an important aspect. 
Similarly, these are all the few other examples of uh, anomalous activity. And you can uh, use these applications in uh, wherever you want to apply. There are many applications are there in anomalous activity, like car parking is anomalous activity and uh, uh, in industry to detect the false products, we can uh, use this anomalous activity. So this is one of the interesting problem. This is a pedestrian data set you can consider here. Uh, this is this is this is the path for the pedestrians, not for the cyclists, not for the bike riders or uh, car driver. But here in this particular uh, pedestrian path, there is a cyclist. He is trying to do the cycling here, and there is a vehicle which is moving here. So these two actions are anomalous activities here in this particular application. So we need to uh, define the anomalous activity. Then we need to develop an algorithm. Similarly, if you can able to see uh, every year from 2018, uh, uh, this uh, in, in CPR conference, there is a challenge which, challenge which is conducted by NVIDIA that is called AI City Challenge in 2018. But in 2019, they have uh, proposed one uh, big data set. By 2021, the data set has already increased with, and they also introduced many challenges. So in this data set, if you'll observe here, this is a uh, anomalous activity uh, detection on highway environment. So on highways, you need to detect the anomalous activity. So here, the different defining the anomalous is the biggest challenge. Their definition of anomalous activity here is on highways, the vehicle should not stop. As per the rules of the highway, the vehicle should not stop. If the vehicle has stopped, that means there wasn't some, some issue was there. So to, to detect such type of things, this challenge they have introduced. These are the few properties of the data. And they have uh, considered many challenges like uh, slow motion, illumination problems, cars in parking area. Because if you can able to see it here, there are a few cars which are which are there in the parking lot. So they which are there in the parking lot here you will observe. And you observe here there is a small uh, patch is there he, he, patches here. So this patch sometimes will go into uh, detect like an uh, object. So that is a problem. And occlusions are very common problem and. Uh, uh, slow motion of the vehicle is also a problem. These are all the challenge. These are all the problems which are they have already introduced. So you need to provide some, one of the solution. Now you now you try to understand what is meant by anomalous activity. What actually we want to do. So now here observe here. This is a uh, mo moving vehicles are there, but there is a vehicle which is uh, not moving here. You observe here. So first you are trying to detect in the uh, anomalous activity. Now you see. So now you're trying to detect in the background. Whenever you're trying to detect in the background, the vehicle which is there on the, um, uh, which the vehicle which is not moving will come onto the background because this is, this is a background estimation. Background means something which is not changing. Now observe here on the left side, there is an accident or happened. So whenever the accident is happening, there is a much disturbance. Now you, now, now you try to observe here. So the vehicles which have a disturbed and which are not moving is now comes under background. Now, if you'll observe here, uh, there's the small synchronization issues there in this example. So if you'll observe here, right side. So whenever the accident is happening, there is a sudden changes are happened. And whenever the things are getting normal, now the things are getting normal here. Now you see, as the time goes on, the number of vehicles are going to be uh, uh, stagnated here. The, the traffic has, uh, uh, the, uh, the, all the vehicles have stopped. So now all the vehicles are comes under background here. Now you see in the right side, all the things are coming, some, coming under background information. So this is uh, one way of solving the anomaly detection. And uh, we can also detect the uh, what is a timestamp of this particular anomaly detection? Where this particular at, at particular what time this particular anomaly activity was happened? That also we can able to um, detect with this particular algorithm. So in order to solve this, let me give you just basic understanding of two algorithms. So this is one of the transfer learning algorithm. From a given uh, given uh, video sequence to extract the spatial information, they have they have used uh, VGC nineteen architecture. No training, simply they have uh, taken the which is 19 architecture to extract the features. To estimate the motion information, they have used this optical flow. And with the help of this motion net, and what are the features they got it, they, has, they have con combined these two features and they have uh, trained the further training. So the which is 19 and motion net features are uh, you know, taken from the uh, 
uh, translating weights only they have taken and they freeze the weights and they have trained the model and this is uh, another uh, article which I, have, which I have talking about the cpr workshop so they have used this particular three different steps here first one is a background modeling second one is the object detection third one is time stamp aware and normal detection at what time the particular anomalous activities happen so first one is background estimated so in order to estimate the background the simple encoder decoder concept has used um, so this is a simple encoder and this is a decoder concept once this particular encoder decoder is over the second one is a tiny object detection so here we need to detect the small size objects so in order to use this tiny object detector they have used this particular uh, um, this particular thing is like uh, yolo architecture YOLO, YOLO architecture they have used to solve the problem. Now observe here from a original samples here. Now observe here. This is a original sample, original video, corresponding corresponding backgrounds which are estimated. And there is a small <coughs> uh, everything is correct, correct here because there is no vehicles have stopped here. This is also vehicle has not stopped. So things are perfectly fine. So in this example, nothing has uh, stopped. So there is no issue. Now you observe here, the vehicle will go to be detected here. Yeah, yeah, you observe here. Initially, here there is no vehicle. You you check my mouse here. Initially, there is no vehicle is available. So as the vehicle is not available in the background, nothing is available here because everything is moving. Here the things are moving. So here in the in the anomaly detection video, nothing has detected because nothing has stopped. But if you will observe here at this particular timestamp, there is a small wave, one vehicle which is coming and is trying to stop here. Then the moment of the vehicle has stopped. So the time the moment of the vehicle has stopped, now it just comes under background. So in, in, in the background, the vehicle has detected. So now this background image we have passed to the object detection. Here the <coughs> object is detected. <coughs> so this is one approach where, where we have, uh, uh, sorry, where this particular other have uh, uh, proven the work. So also you can able to see this is a small vehicle which is there uh, in between the road that is that is have uh, not moving and this all this object also going to be detected very tiny objects. Now there are some false positives also there. Now you observe here the things are moving on the left side and background also uh, exactly detected. There is no issue, but this algorithm has failed to uh, detect this false edges because because if you observe here here there is a small patch and this patch is appeared in this particular background now this patch is so small in such a way that it is going to create an Ill the model has confused to differentiate this patch and a small object like a car so this particular problem was also there in the what are the algorithm which we have shown earlier so this is uh, another way of solving a problem of anomaly detection and this particular challenge is going to appear uh, happen for every year in cvpr if anybody interested you may can um, verify that okay thank you if you have any questions please you guys can discuss thank you so very much uh, santosh it is always pleasure listening to you uh, questions participants there is one ashwin yado he has raised in his hand request ashwit please ask your question am I audible ma'am yes I audible? very much very much uh, dr viparthi one question uh, regarding this uh, uh, generally like we talk about what is the estimating the minimum training data set so one approach uh, is it valid like we because there are no fixed answer so we keep increasing the training data and see what map we achieve and then graph it or plot it and then uh, thereby we can estimate the uh, the number of minimum images required to achieve a, a desired accuracy though it is a rough approach sir whenever we have a minimum data actually this is the one of the biggest challenging thing <laughs> yes we are also trying to exploring on to solve how we have a minimum data then how to solve it there but there are few algorithms are there that also we'll going to discuss in the uh, last day of, of the session Whenever we have a minimum data, how, how we can able to solve the problems? Not we when I, I was, but not succeeded. Yeah, my, my question is basically like uh, we want to train the model with the highest accurate to achieve highest accuracy with 
the least possible data so one doesn't know how much that number exactly is so that is why i thought ki probably one could in keep increasing the training data set and see the improvement in the achieved accuracy and then plot it and thereby one can estimate that okay if i want 90% then i'll require these many images Uh, is that uh, but sir um, i understand your intention but the question here is that uh, as such there is no such uh, measure that uh, okay, okay. to get x accuracy you need uh, some amount of p percentage of data yeah, yeah. as such there is no yeah, measure yeah. Uh, no oh, yeah. so that, uh, that can be one approach okay. maybe tried but it, it may not be a, a general solution for other applications right okay so we can't conclude hmm. thank you Yes, sir. Any any further questions? If you want to ask. Yeah, there are two more hands raised. Kalpana ji, you please un unmute yourself. Kalpana. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Sir, but uh, what is the basic difference between the framework and the model? Plain. Framework and model. Yes, framework. Ma'am, it is framework. a terminology to say. Framework is a complete end-to-end uh, -end solution. Um, suppose for X X application, you are passing an input and you are trying to get an output. The things which I have used in between, everything is like a package. Generally, that we can call it as a framework. Mod model or module? What you said? So uh, I couldn't hear you, uh, Santosh ji. If they are asking uh, about the framework, what is the difference of framework and uh, model or module? Something they are. Yeah, so mo model is a single like network. You know that it's a single uh, piece, whereas framework gives you options for changing the yeah. components, right? Whereas model is everything is frozen. Yeah. Framework yeah. will give you an option like which classifier do you choose. it can give you uh, some pre processing element it can be processing element and so for each component what if uh, i hope uh, i have and i have understood the question correctly and i'm so sorry uh, there was some voice breaking so that's the reason i am responding is is santosh there yeah yeah ma'am i'm 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 oh, here you are there yeah. so uh, perhaps today my network is a little weak No, no so, I also didn't hear her uh, question properly. I mean, uh, what are the? Acha, okay, okay. She was perhaps asking for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shkalpana ji, is uh, is this your question? What is the difference between a framework? Framework provides you like it's a, a full like you have flexibility to change different components. I don't know if she is there or not. Uh, uh, then this is H H T C. You have not written your name correctly, but I am unmuting yourself. Uh, please H S T C. What is your name? Please tell. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. My name is Anjani Kumar. Ma'am. What is your name? My name is Anjani Kumar. Ma'am. Okay, Anjani. Yes, please. Ma'am, can I use? Follow for defense object detection in case of long range object and some aerial object, aerial vehicles. Yeah, uh, that is what we will going to discuss on the last day. That is one problem we will discuss. That uh, whatever the objects you have detected in a normal view, and those objects may going to those algorithms may going to fail whenever you are applying in a aerial view. that is what the reason i have explained on this particular slide that the yolo uh, algorithms are uh, what are the retinet algorithms they initially they have focused on focus to solve these problems uh, yeah this particular slide uh, i was talking about so in order to solve aerial view of course here they have used the existing concepts of uh, yolo or uh, retina net consoles but they have we need to make necessary changes which is uh, which which may going to perform better in the aerial view we need to use it but directly simply we may you know you may not going to blindly test on the another application of course we can use it yes. 
is that question is clear i mean yeah yeah i think clear or so basically more on this you will listen from him on the last day okay you are pictures we will going to discuss and a few other new solutions also we will going to discuss in other application i want to ask what is so the... one more so somebody is asking that uh, oh. dipesh yeah dipesh ji the the purpose of segmentation is like uh, generally that uh, whenever you want to finding out any of your region of interest that means you have a bigger image and uh, you no need to focus on everything but you want to focus only on a particular region only that particular region information you want to extract there we can able to use the segmentations you can apply this concept of segmentation in many applications depends upon your uh, uh, area for example uh, some uh, some segmentation concepts where trees can be segmented similar in content can be segmented into one area and uh, cars can be segmented like that so we can use it but where to use it is all depends upon uh, our application choice you have written something in uh, e, e, this is what your question or something else you want to ask yes okay fine so slides will be available some people are asking for slides don't worry about it uh if there are no questions further questions we thank uh, dr santosh vipathi for his uh, such a wonderful session and it is as i say that's always we get something new listening to you so dr santosh on behalf of iit academies at iit rurki mnit jaipur nit patna nit varangal and triple it dm jabalpur be sincerely thank you and hope that you will continue to support the cause of eict academy thank you so very much we want to listen to you again i mean we are so keen to listen to you on the last day that is march 4 thank you ma'am thanks it's my pleasure to work with